here we talk about after solidification what happens. So, it has come from liquidus to solidus. Now, solidus to room temperature what changes are happening in the molten metal or in the casting. So, in this particular part we will we'll, we'll talk about <coughs> essentially how the cooling rates affect the structure, microstructure and properties okay. and within that we talk about uh, how they affect your mechanical properties, the linear contraction what happens, what kind of stresses develop in the casting and due because stresses it creates distortion or uh, hot tears and things like that, we will we'll get a basic scientific idea about those things, how they are formed. <coughs> so, this we go, go back from the original one which is pure metal and alloy. Okay. Now, when a pure metal solidifies, okay, initially the solidification starts from the boundary of the mold and there the conditions are <coughs> very favorable for rapid solidification and the grow, grain growth. So, a lot of grains start growing at the boundary okay, and by the time they grow someone else is already there on the next to that. So, they do not can cannot grow in size. So, a large number of grains growing simultaneously and they cannot grow too much because there are neighbors we are obstructing that. So, you get a fine structure on the boundary. Then once the boundary thing is done the cooling starts slows down little bit, but now the heat transfer is mainly from interior to outside and along the cooling direction from inside heat is coming inside to outside the opposite of the direction is where the grain growth is taking place. So, you get a columnar grains with dendritic structures in the second zone. If it is pure metal this goes all the way through the center of the casting, but if it is a alloy what happens here is you get your the middle area of casting where you have a large area with the your mushy state liquid solidus. Your large area where temperatures are constant gradients are not very high. So, some way some grain will grow and it has enough time to keep growing in size before it hits another grain and the very few grains. So, you get a few number of large grains in the center of a uh, alloy. Okay. So, essentially you get three kinds of structure, you get a fine structure on the boundary of both pure metals and, and alloys, then you followed by columnar grains and in the center if it is alloy you get a few number of large grains. Okay. The basic cut section of a casting will look like that. Now, how does it really affect? <coughs> if you look at gradient, temperature gradient and the grain growth rate in a sense we are talking about the same grain growth rate here you get this different structures. Just look at the first one and last one. The first one is your where temperature gradient is very high. Okay. Temperature gradient is very high and gra grains cannot grow very big because you have large number of grains competing with each other. There you get the first structure and look at the last structure there where you have temperature gradient is very small in the middle of the casting and grains have all the time in the world to grow big. So, there you get your coarse grains. So, this is your you already know coarse grains and fine grains, but this gives you a picture of the relationship between that and your temperature gradient and your grain, grain growth rate. We can use it later on to understand how properties change. Now, we know that these microstructure and properties have a good correlation and typically we depending on the graphite phase especially in a cast iron or ferrite or ferrite perlite or perlitic ductile iron you get different properties as you go from ferrite to perlite ductile iron you get more and more strength more and more hardness and these come directly from the grain structure the type of phase and the distribution of phase and the size of the grains. If you look at steels again if you look at ferritic steel and ferritic and perlitic phase steel more perlite is there again same thing you see is as the carbon increases and perlite increase you have higher strength and higher hardness coming up. Okay. Similarly, aluminum silicon alloys depending on the there is a hypo or hyper eutectic okay, and depending on the silicon content and depending on the phase again you have different kind of properties. We are just summarizing in a few slides the metallurgical knowledge of the influence of phases and the grain sizes and grain phase uh, distribution phases on the properties. <coughs> that is about a, the basic properties. Now, your casting is continuing to contract. So, grain is formed, but now it is con continuing to contract to the room temperature. If you look at aluminum and look at do a basic simple calculation here from the handbooks physics handbooks the linear contraction or coefficient thermal expansion of aluminum is let us say 20 into 10 to the power minus 6 per degree centigrade which means meter per meter or you can say microns per meter if you want. 
Now, cooling ratio of aluminum typically if you take it as 660 minus 25. So, what is the actual contraction of aluminum? You just multiply these two, you get your linear contraction. Okay. Very nice. Do not have to go to handbooks. You just get the accurate value of linear contraction by multiplying your coefficient with the actual temperature range, which is not difficult to do. And these where data are available in the even in the web very easily. What about steel? Steel coefficient thermal expansion is 16 only, but because steel has a longer temperature to cool all the way from let us say 1500 to room temperature, you get 2.4 percent contraction. Okay, much more contraction in steel than aluminum, almost twice. Okay, but does it really co contract completely? Now look at this. A, a cube casting like this, which is completely free to contract, there is no hindrance from the mold at all, will experience that 1.3 for aluminum and 2.4 percent for steel. But the moment you put some constraint in the middle, for example, I put a core, now casting is not free to contract anymore. Casting is trying to contract, but the core is preventing it from contracting. So, you will get something little less than that. In aluminum, you might get 1 percent, in steel, you might get 1.6 percent. But if you increase the, uh, the, the constraint even more, suppose I have a hard mold and I have a circular shape or a U shape or a channel shape, mold just does not allow me to contract and I have very thin, thin casting to even apply pressure. It can come down to as low as half of that original values. So, the amount of contraction allowance I need to apply starts looking at not only your metal and the temperatures, but also the restraint or constraint in the mold. And we can estimate from this little bit how much to apply where. We will go from here this basic knowledge to how to apply contraction allowance in tomorrow's class and we apply this knowledge in a scientific way. But that is not enough. What also happens is as the casting cools, okay, you see the left side casting the vertical portions will cool first and then the corners will cool last because corners are hot because of heat accumulation in the corners. As the corners are trying to cool at the end, the, the channel opens up and also if you see the bottom, you start seeing a camber and you can literally visualize how it happens by visualizing the, the cooling profile of the casting. Okay. That is actually happy news. If it is a looking at other part and you have to understand the second part very carefully which I will say there are two, two vertical arms, right? one is thick arm, one is thin arm. If I ask you which is stronger, what will you say? The thicker one is stronger, but actually as casting cools, thinner one is stronger. Why? Thinner one cools first, becomes solid, it is a solid steel. The thicker one is still cooling, it is still you know, it is hot and soft. So, thin one is preventing the thick one from solidifying initially. I mean, it is strong and it remains strong, but eventually when the thick one starts solidifying, then thick one is stronger and thin one starts bending. So, you see a profile like that. So, if you really just visualize the strength and then the temperature and which is applying stress on whom, you can visualize how that casting is going to distort. And it is important for castings like this. The many casting, box casting where you have different wall thicknesses and you can start visualizing how it is going to distort. But again, that is again a good news. What happens later on we will see is, if the thing becomes too much, the casting will crack, but I will come to that in a minute. But we are trying to draw some graph here, which will be actually useful for you without using computers. What we have done is, we said let us have a small simple equation saying, you know we remember we use our complexity volume ratio. You remember volume ratio in the, in the morning? I can use volume ratio here in a very nice way. Okay. I say my volume ratio is nothing but part volume by bounding box volume. In case of a bar, the ratio is equal to 1. In case of dumbbell, it will be slightly less than 1 because the middle portion there is a there is less material. And the last one will be really low because the bounding box volume will be much bigger. This is a very thin, thin part. If I use this, I draw a graph. You can actually use this graph to apply a little more accurate contraction allowance. What do you see in this graph? The volume ratio, okay, if it is 1, First, you look at the right side. If the volume ratio is 1 means it is a simple shape like the bar shape or a, or a solid block shape. If the ratio is 1, you get a theoretical value of the contraction elements which is 1.3 for aluminum and 2.4 for steel. As the ratio value reduces, you have more and more complicated shape, you start, start needing to apply 
less and less contraction volume, contraction allowance. So, very complicated casting, it will contract less because it has more things. But this is for an overall thing. You would actually start applying the equation in differential portion of casting and see which portion will shrink how much and so on, which is not that easy by manual, manual operation. Now, in a metal mold, things are little complicated. I do not know whether you can follow the simple logic here. In a metal mold, casting is contracting, but metal mold also is heating and heating and cooling. So, you have to compensate for that. And if it is investment casting, you have more complications. You have the, the dye in which wax is injected, that is his, its contraction, the contraction of the wax. Then you make a shell out of the wax pattern, the contraction of the shell. Then the expansion of the shell again when you heat the shell and then contraction of the metal in the shell finally. So, all this plus and minus, plus and minus, you have to keep looking at that. And remember, it is not simple plus and minus because different places have different plus and minus values. So, there is no doubt, no surprise that it is very difficult to get the investment castings dimensions right. It is very difficult. And people expect very good dimension tolerance in investment castings. So, it is even more difficult to match the expectations. <laughs> okay. So, this equation tells you how to get the contraction for a metal die. So, I will just leave it to you for you to think, think in the tonight. But I want to come to finally end with this hot tear. What is happening here is in this picture, if you see, you have two thick portions connected by one thin portion. What happens? The thick portions solidify last, okay? And as they solidify last, they are going to put this, and, and the, at the corners, the thick and thin section corner is there. You have a sudden change in temperature and gradient and thickness. It's a sharp corner. This combination of high temperature and high gradient and, and high cooling rate also, combination of that. Temperature makes this area weak. High gradient and high differential cooling gives you differential contraction forces. Okay? And then you have this high curvature which gives you stress concentration on top of that. The combination of the whole thing okay, gives you a crack in those corner portions. But it is not simple to predict cracks all the time. Because what you do not know is, some stress will remain in the casting like residual stress, some will open up. When it opens up, when it remains in residual stress, it is not easy to predict that. It is again a function of lot of other parameters including process parameters. So, we can only say stress will be there, so much stress will be there, whether it opens up as a crack or distorts, we do not know. But let us go back to the same shape here. Okay? So, because of this, the thinner section which cools first and therefore, it is stronger. When the thick section is starting to cool, thick section although it is thick, it is actually weaker because it is soft, it is hot and soft. So, thick section will really remain rigid and when the thick section is cooling, it might open up into a crack. The moment it opens as a crack, actually stress is released completely, but then of course, crack casting is no good for you <laughs> even if there is no stress. So, you have to and what is happening here? Again, same combination of thing which lead to you have the crack here. Okay. So, what you learnt in this lesson is the solidification leads to these defects and you can have micro uh, porosity or a macro porosity depending on the combination of cutoff values of your temperature and gradient values. And then the contraction which happens beyond solidus to room temperature can lead to first of all microstructure and properties and secondly it leads to your either stresses or distortion or cracks in a worst case. Okay. What is called as hot tear if it is in a hot condition or it stresses really after a few days in a cold condition, we call it as a cold crack. Okay. And all these, once you understand that, we should be able to try and figure out how to apply allowances and how to apply a feeding system to prevent the defects from forming, getting the right properties and getting the right uh, microstructure. <coughs>